right, great. Well, welcome. Um, my name is Amy Stevenson. I am the communications manager here at MICA. I'm actually proudly sitting in for uh, Allison Green, who you may know. She's our actual training manager. And she's at home, as you can imagine, relaxing and getting lots of sleep with a brand new baby and a three-year-old. So I definitely got the easier uh, part of the gig for her for the next couple months of taking over her training. So welcome to you all. Um, the class that we're presenting today, as it says on the slide, a holistic perspective of substance abuse and misuse. And we really sincerely want to thank um, the folks from Cherry Health to come in. They are the frontline experts to share with you their knowledge. And I just want to welcome Bob Smith. He's the Director of Be uh, Behavioral Health Therapy at Cherry Health. Um, we have Nancy Gorman. Can you wave, Nancy, to make sure we have you on there also? Um, she's a recovery coach at Cherry Health. And then we also have Taylor Pettit Rademacher. She's the Development and Training Manager here as well. Um, so we'll turn things over to them. And just as a reminder, this uh, training will be recorded and put on our YouTube channel so that if you want to replay this at a staff meeting or some other time, it will be available in the next couple of days to share as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Taylor and the group. And thank you all again for attending this morning or this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for having us. Uh, Cherry Health is really excited to be able to participate in this. We are an organization who provides a variety of substance use services to individuals who need it. So we are very grateful to be able to come in and talk to everyone today and have, that everyone has taken the time, time to County. participate. So before, yeah, uh, no, yeah, no, okay. No, no problem. So as Amy mentioned, uh, we would really enjoy this to be interactive. So at any time, if you have a question or a comment, please feel free to unmute or use the chat. We have three of us on here today, so we will monitor that and make sure that we're answering those as they pop up. Um, so I would like to introduce, as Amy did a quick introduction, our two presenters for the clinical content. Uh, Bob Smith and Nancy Gorman. So we have two individuals who have a wealth of knowledge around substance use services uh, within the community that they're serving. So they are, as Amy said, really our frontline experts. So here to give you their clinical knowledge and firsthand experience and hopefully broaden the perspective around uh, substance use and substance use disorders. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Bob and Nance. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, just a quick background. I think Nance and I will just give you some quick background on ourselves just so you all know who you're talking to. My name is Bob Smith. I've been working in the field of um, uh, recovery, working with people towards recovery for over a decade um, in various roles and in, in, uh, programming, including residential treatment, outpatient treatment, medication assisted treatment, um, and so I'm really happy to be here and looking forward to um, having a great conversation around this topic. Nancy, you want to do a quick introduction about yourself? Hey friends, um, like Bob said, my name is Nance. I'm a recovery coach at Cherry Health. Um, I've been working in recovery for seven, close to eight years now. Uh, it's something I'm really passionate about and I am looking forward to sharing sharing information with you as much as I can. So we've got some uh, um, agenda objectives here. Um, and one of the things that we're hoping to share with you all is um, being able to identify at least two substances one may use, verbalizing the difference between substance use and misuse, and identifying at least one stigmatizing word related to substance use. Uh, spoiler alert, I think, um, this idea of stigmatizing words related to substance use is probably one of the hottest topics that you'll get an answer eye on um, because it, it changes perspective and it changes how we do our work. So um, I'm looking forward to that conversation. All right, so substance use. And as we mentioned before, we are really looking for this to be interactive and so, as you can, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that um, you all will feel comfortable in unmuting yourself, sharing um, and being a participant in this. Just a reminder that 
once you unmute your, yourself, remember to mute yourself again, because it can be pretty distracting for presenters and everyone else. Um, so types of substances, here's a big long list that we threw out here, um, but I wanna hear from you all, uh, what are substances that um, come to mind when we think of, of substance use? Our biggest two at the shelter are heroin and alcohol. Okay, uh, heroin and alcohol, great. What else? Prescriptions. What kind of prescriptions, Leo? Like Xanax or, you know, Oxycontin, all sorts of stuff. Okay, Xanax, Oxycontin, I see in the chat, opioids. And then the chat also said food. Ah. And sugar was just added too. I've seen a lot of folks using things that are like, um, like substitute substances, if you will, like K2 or spice or like nitrous, things like that, that you can buy at a store. I see that a lot. Yep. Sorry, synthetics, man-made. Mm -hmm. We're getting a lot of meth and alcohol up here in the, I'm in the UP. All right. Yep. Meth is, meth is really kind of blown up over the last couple of years. Um, we see that being a huge issue all over the place. What else? We have quite a bit of Suboxone misuse up here too. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll get into that a little bit, that misuse portion. I'd say uh, at our shelter, alcohol is probably the biggest one, but even though it's legal, um, marijuana, um, we're finding lots of edibles uh, throughout because that's probably the most discreet way, you know, to not smell like anything. Yep. Yeah, man, it's amazing what the uh, cannabis industry has done, right? When you think about the vape cartridges or the edibles, um, not to mention that they keep getting more and more potent. Uh, there's a few in the chat, fentanyl and kratom. Okay, yeah. Ketamine. Mm -hmm. So... I was walking here, I, I was actually at the state SUD conference just a minute ago, and I was walking here today uh, back to my office to do this. And I was thinking like, man, I had a bunch of caffeine today, right? And like, uh, wow, I'm feeling pretty wired. Um, and here I come in to do this um, presentation on substances and types of substances that um, people might misuse or, or use. Caffeine is one of those most common substances that any of us might run across, right? And, and in fact, so common that it's just normalized, right? Like how many of you go into a, a morning meeting and say, man, I haven't had my caffeine yet today and don't even have an, a, that, that like really big thought about what is the point of that caffeine? What are we looking for from that caffeine use? And so I wanna throw that out here because I think that a lot of times when we talk about substance use, what we're actually talking about is the stigma that comes with substance use and how that impacts um, our communities, um, families and friends, and just kind of normalizing this idea that at some level, each and every one of us are using something to alter maybe our behaviors, how we feel emotionally, um, and that substance use is just a, a fairly regular thing that is going on in um, the vast majority of our lives day to day. Food was brought up, right? Sugar, how does that impact us? Um, so there were, some, there were some different substances thrown out here that I think will probably be new for a lot of people. Um, so Kratom, that's one that um, if you're not in the field, you might be like, what is Kratom and why does that name sound so crazy, right? Um, we've got that K2, other synthetics, um, bath salts. That was a big thing when I was working in residential up in the UP. Um, in fact, Marquette, Michigan, uh, during the bath salt uh, phase was a really big hot spot um, in the country for bath salts. Uh, what we're talking about are synthetic um, substances that are created in a lab, marketed in, in ways that, that circumvent our DEA and other um, uh, government organizations that try and handle substance use, and they end up out into the general public without any oversight. Um, Kratom is a, is a natural um, plant and used and can be used in different ways and produce different effects. So depending on how much you use, it might have a, um, an upping effect 
like cocaine or a depressing effect like an opioid. You might see here like, and I'll use this term interchangeable, interchangeably, uh, sometimes you Oh, I think Bob froze. I just messaged him to let him know. Maybe we'll give okay. him a second. And he's back. <laughs> oh, perfect. We found you. Uh -oh. It froze. Uh, it froze on interchangeably. Uh oh. Okay. So, um, opioid, opiates. The distinction is when we talk about an opiate, that would be um, kind of in its uh, substance that's created out of that natural fo form, the, the poppy plant. Um, an opioid would be a synthetic um, development of, of an opioid like fentanyl. Any other thoughts on this? Any other questions when we get, get into types of substances? No one really talked about over-the-counter medications. Um, and I think that that has been really popular lately, you know, like the Sudafed, the cough syrup, things like that. There's a laxative that has opiates in it. So if you take a bunch of it, you can get that opiate like high. One of the things I ran into working in residential, Mucinex, um, taken in, uh, take a whole pack of it can give you almost like that drunk feeling. Um, and so there are lots and lots of over-the-counter medications that people are, are using and abusing to um, kind of alter their state of mind. Also, uh, psychedelics weren't really mentioned too. That's right. So Leo, what kind of psych psychedelics are you speaking to? Uh, LSD and mushrooms. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's lots of others that I'm unaware of too. <laughs> yep. Like so we talked synthetics. <laughs> yep. So we talked about those those synthetics. Um, oh, geez, it's escaping me. I just had it on the tip of my tongue. Um, 2CI, 2CB. A lot of times these synthetics have some um, interesting names. Um, but yes, lab, lab made um, hallucinogens. They are out there. Uh, Tide pods. Yeah. Yeah, don't eat Tide pods. So lean is cough syrup and Sprite mixed together. Someone had asked that in the chat. And that would be an opioid cough syrup. All right, so now that we got that out of the way, let's move on. All right, so substances in, in the brain. I, I'm often um, surprised at different ways that we look at substances and the reason that people may or may not use substances. The thing that I always land on is this idea that no one wakes up one morning and decides that they want to experience opioid withdrawal. And no one wakes up in the morning and decides that they, they really want to use alcohol to the point where they, if they stop, they end up having a seizure. Um, and that substance use is, is absolutely um, in no way a moral deficit, which is um, a bit of a perspective that I think has been around for quite a while. And we're really focused on the disease model of addiction. So understanding how substances interact with our brain and our body, um, the reason that people might become um, substance dependent um, and their struggle to discontinue that use of substances. So the disease model of addiction, we're looking at behavioral, we're looking at psychological, we're looking at environmental, we're looking at biological factors that come into uh, someone's substance use. We're getting away from that stigma that um, this is a, a person problem, a moral deficit. We're really looking at the science around addiction. We're looking at the science about how we treat people who struggle with addictions. There's some uh, key areas of the brain here. I'm going to do a super high level overview of this um, and welcome any discussion that you would like to have further on it. 
Um, so we've got the basal ganglia. Uh, essentially, this is the part of our brain that increases reward feeling. It boosts dopamine production. Um, and so when some, someone is using a substances, substance, this is the part of the brain that says, hey, I like that, that feels good. So on my way to work today, as I'm drinking my caffeine, right, that caffeine is providing me a boost of dopamine. It's waking me up. It's getting me ready for the day, right? Like that's why I'm drinking coffee. Um, we've got our amygdala, which alleviates distressing feelings such as anxiety. Someone stops using substances, how do they feel? So an op opioid is gonna, um, someone who uses opioids, they may experience withdrawal symptoms. Those withdrawal symptoms may increase an emotional state that feels uncomfortable. Our amygdala is driving this, this bad feeling and it helps to tell us, hey, if I use more of that, I'm going to feel better. Our prefrontal cortex, it's, it is really the newest part of our brain. It's the, the last to hook up um, or one of the last to hook up. Um, hooks up later in life in men than female. Uh, so yeah, mine took a while to get together. Um, and this is kind of that part of our brain that really focuses on rational thinking, decision-making. Um, it's the reason that our kids probably shouldn't be drinking and smoking weed because their <laughs> brains just aren't hooked up right and they're not making sound choices. Any questions on that? Bob, I had one question in regards to your comment about the model being looked at more as a disease versus a moral character issue. Um, I'm a parent of 23 and 20 year old, and I know they look at it very differently than let's say their grandparents do about the moral issue. Do you see that changing though generationally in general of a different view about that disease model versus moral character? Absolutely. I think it, you know, there's a lot of factors that come into this too. Um, so when I first started working in the field, I was working uh, in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, right? And in that community, um, it was probably more likely to hear it talked about as a moral deficit than a disease. Now I come down to Grand Rapids, we're a little bit ahead of the times or, or closer to the times, and it's much easier to talk about this as a disease model. Um, there is tons and tons and tons of research out there right now um, and has been supporting the disease model of addiction. One of the, we're going to get into this when we talk about our words, you know, um, but this idea that like someone struggles with heart disease or diabetes, we don't talk about them as being clean or dirty like we do with people who struggle with a substance use disorder. And so there's a whole stigma attached to, to folks who struggle with addictions that has to be overcome as we are also um, presenting the, the science around that shift. Right. Hey, this is Janine. I just wanted to add to that point too. I think it's a lot more productive and helpful to look at it from that point of view because otherwise a lot of people just end up blaming them for being in that position and that's just not productive. Janine, you are spot on. I'd also like to add to that just the fact that when we're talking about this disease model, we a lot of people that are on the other end of it don't take into account that a lot of times the addiction is a symptom of mental illness. So that's just a mm -hmm. symptom. I think a lot of this plays into our next slide about the social impacts of substance use. So this is really great. Well, speaking, speaking of social impacts. <laughs> So uh, some of the stigma, you know, can come from a lot of places. It can be personal stigma or it could be stigma from social. You know, Bob has the individual, organizational and societal implications. Um, one thing that I think is not talked about a lot is the self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, a lot of people who are in active addiction, they don't feel great about it. You know, Bob said that 
we don't wake up one day and just decide that we're going to be an addict or junkie or whatever people want to say. Um, it is a sign of mental illness when people abuse drugs. So when we stigmatize it, a lot of times we're telling people, well, you're a failure, you're a junkie, you're never going to be able to get clean. And when that stigma exists and people are saying or implying things like this, it really makes people not want to get help because what's the point almost? So that can lead to, you know, like Bob has, increased substance use, decreased help seeking behaviors and decreased treatment adherence. You know, a lot of people, you hear that you're never going to get better just something that you believe. So hopefully by talking about addiction, looking at it in a medical versus moral failing standpoint, we can reduce some of the stigma surrounding it and then get people into treatment and get people into help because they don't feel so bad about asking for help. The stigma is, um, this is a huge, huge deal. So at one point, I went on a mission to email MLive anytime I watched it come through with with substance use. Um, that was my mission, right? Is I was emailing mm -hmm. editors like, you know, if you're using the term clean and dirty in your articles, what does that actually mean? Providing education towards um, our news outlets. Uh, I don't know, four or five years ago, I was listening to NPR and, and I literally in a news broadcast on NPR, they were talking about people being clean and dirty, right? Like this is a nationally syndicated radio station that, that millions of people are listening to. And that's still what we are talking about in 2020s, right? And so I, I guess I would hope that all of you walk away from here feeling confident to when you hear that term clean, dirty, or any of these other terms that Nancy's going to go over here in a little bit, um, to challenge them because that stigma is really on all of us. We either get to perpetuate it or we get to help end that stigma. The better that we get at slowing the stigma down around substance use, the better we actually get at providing quality treatment to people, helping people recover, helping people to go on and be, um, you know, really amazing parts of our society. Um, these are folks that really have amazing qualities and we don't need to be stigmatizing them. We need to be bringing people up. Um, so very important here, the social impacts, we, we feel them every day. We feel them in our offices, we hear them on the news, um, even in the way that we speak to our children um, in our future generations. It's our, it's our time to, to start shaping our words and changing that. So it looks like Bob has a, a good point here in the chat, chat, and I'll read it in case someone can't see it. Uh, one of the worst parts of the stigma is that it holds over, is that it holds over into recovery. People in recovery should be proud of the help they have received and the new healthy choices they can make. Instead of meeting, instead meetings are still hidden and people don't want anyone to know that they live in recovery. If they were proud and open, it might be easier to reach those in need. So I have, a, I have quite a bit to say on this subject. Um, I think it's really easy to generalize and say that if someone is in recovery, they need to share their story and they need to be open and honest. Um, unfortunately, that's just not, not reasonable. Um, there's lots of reasons people might hide their recovery, you know, they're embarrassed about it, or they're afraid that their job might find out, or they're afraid that their other parent, their other parent um, of their children might be worried. Um, I know when I first entered recovery, I didn't want to talk about my recovery because I was embarrassed. I mean, you admit that you're in recovery, you're admitting that you have a problem, which just goes back to that stigma. But I believe, yes, if people are willing and feel like they're in a place to share their story, absolutely. Because um, like Bob said, it does show people that recovery is possible and that you can overcome everything. Um, it's just really important to remember that we shouldn't push people in recovery to share their stories. 
um, definitely we can express to them why it is good for people. Um, just, you know, not everyone is in a position to be able to be open and honest about their recovery. I'd like to agree with that, Nance, um, if I may. Uh, we have an organization in Ann Arbor and Jackson called Home A New Vision, and they sponsor recovery out loud get togethers where people in recovery take their signs and walk down the street and holler about recover out loud to let people know that yes, we are proud to be in recovery from our own issues, whatever they may be. Um, but I think you're right. There's still so much stigma attached to it in the workplace, in family situations, in, just everywhere that sometimes it's safer to keep quiet about it than it is to brag on it. So what a wonderful world it will be in when that stigma can slide to our past memories, right? It looks like uh, Zuzana had her hand up. They wanted to say something. Hi, I uh, just had a question. Maybe this will be uh, addressed later, so forgive me. I come across a lot of families uh, who have a loved one suffering with an addiction, and sometimes they'll try to get into recovery or they might not be ready for it yet. What suggestions do you guys have for family members or even friends to stay supportive of that individual and encourage them to get healthy or do what they need to do, but also still maintain those boundaries if, if they do feel like it might be too much for them? Susanna, I think we're going to address that here in a couple slides when we talk about readiness to change and um, stage match objectives. Is it okay if we kind of table that and if we don't get uh, directly to your answer that you can bring this back up? Sure, of course. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Taylor, I think we can move on to the next slide. So, Nance, you got this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So, we wanted to talk a little bit about the terms use and misuse. I think they're used interchangeably a lot of times, but there is a distinguishing factor. Um, when we talk about use, um, it's typically used to refer to a person who's using illicit substances, you know, heroin, crack, co or yeah, heroin crack, marijuana, things like that. Um, when we talk about misuse, that's, tech, that's usually used when someone's misusing prescription drugs, you know, drugs that were prescribed by a doctor that they are not taking how it's supposed to. Um, like I said, I know myself, I use them very interchangeably. Um, and I think that you'll come across that a lot when talking to the recovery community in general and recovery professionals. Um, so just one of those things, keep in mind, technically there is a difference. Not a lot of people use them technically how they're supposed to be. <laughs> um, another thing that I wanted to point out was the difference between a lapse and relapse. Did anyone know there was a difference before they saw this slide? I did. Okay, good. So um, a lot of times, you know, someone will have a bout of sobriety and then they will use again. And I think it's really important that we frame what happened as a lapse or a relapse. In a lapse is someone has been in, in recovery, they've abstained from using substances, they have a slip up, they end up using. A lapse is just a short period of time of use before you before that person realizes that that's not what they want to do. They want to get back into recovery. A relapse is when they return to those using behaviors. You know, they're contacting their dealers. They're going around people who might have um, who they know are carrying substances, things like that. Um, so I think it's really important to, if you have a client, you frame it 
as what it is. Um, someone in the chat said that they've heard this as a slip versus a slide. I think that is a good way to put it too, you know. And a lot of times, you know, going back to that stigma, people don't like to disclose they relapsed or lapsed because they're afraid that, you know, they're going to be letting down the people that are trying to help them. So if we can talk about it and normalize it as a part of recovery, then that will help. And, you know, if you can say to a client, well, it sounds like you had a lapse instead of a relapse, that could give them the confidence that they need to continue with their recovery. Um, and another part that isn't talked a lot about in the recovery community professionally or in general is the difference between abstinence and recovery. Um, so when you look at abstinence, that's removing all substance use, you know, not using alcohol or any medi or any illicit substances, only taking the medication that your doctor prescribed, things like that. When we look at recovery, abstinence can be part of recovery, but it is not the only part. Um, recovery is the process to improve your health and wellness, life, a self direct live a self-directed life and strive to reach full potential. Really, when I think of recovery, um, I look at it as the holistic way to improve your life. You know, it's not just you stop taking the substances and you're healed. Um, going back to what someone said when we first started, substance use can be a sign of mental illness. So being in recovery is getting that figured out, you know, going to a therapist or going to a psych doctor and getting that looked at, going to your primary care physician, going to the dentist, going to the eye doctor. You know, a lot of people, I know myself when I was in active addiction, didn't go to the dentist for 10 years because it's just not something that you think about. So getting into recovery is handling every part of your life that has been put on the back burner due to active use. I think this idea of lapse and relapse also goes back to our discussion about stigma. It's it's really like when I first got into the field, it was really common that if someone had a lapse, they'd come in and say, well, all that time is wasted. Now I have to start over, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the idea that like somehow one little lapse equaled losing all the work that they had done to get to that point, right? And, you know, when when I have someone come in and talk to me, the first thing I ask them is, what did you learn, right? I'm not trying to beat them up. I'm not trying to tell them how bad they were. None of that matters. Um, there are learning opportunities out, out of everything that we do every day. And part of our role in the healthy profession is, is really not driving that stigma, not causing someone to feel poorly about themselves, helping them figure out what they got out of that, that um, series of events. Right. It also helps them to move on, to move forward mm -hmm. and not have to feel so negatively about themselves. That shame and guilt that people hold on to is such a driver for continued use that our job is to help people really focus on what's been going well. Yes, you may have had a lapse. Yes, you're still working a recovery program. Those things can be true at the same time. Yes. It looks like Bob has his hand up to ask a question. Yeah, the uh, I the thing with the abstinence versus the recovery, what um, I've noticed that for for me anyway, what's what's what I tend to focus on is when you're in recovery, you're in a, a brand new lifestyle. Whereas when you're abstaining, you're just not using. And I find that when you're focusing on not using, you're not living your new life. You're not reconnecting. You're not recovering that which you've lost due to your addiction. And your addiction is still running the show, even though you're not using. So that's how I've tried to differentiate that for some of my clients. So there is a term for that in the AA community called white knuckling. So that basically exactly what you said. It means you're not looking to change anything in your life. You're just now abstaining from the substances. Um, and everything that you said was very spot on. Yes, if we just say stop taking your drugs and don't try to fix anything else, there's no motivation. You know, a lot of people are using because they're homeless or they can't find a job or things like that. You know, we can't just expect people to stop using while we're not addressing the reasons 
that they are using. One of my favorite things to say to people is it would be absurd for me to expect you to do anything different without something better in place. There's a mm -hmm. reason that people are using substances. There's a yeah. reason that they go to that to help cope. And unless we are helping people learn something different, something better to replace it, I should fully expect that it will continue. All right, next slide. So this is our diagnostic criteria for substance use, uh, for substance use disorder. Um, this came out of the DSM-5. There's an update to the DSM, the DSM-5-TR, uh, which is text revision. Uh, but, but this is the workable uh, diagnostic criteria that we've got. I'm not going to go through this. I'm not going to read this. Um, I think the important thing about seeing a di diagnostic criteria like this is it supports our idea of the disease model. And, and I want to have a quick conversation about why we diagnose certain mental, mental health issues or substance use disorders. And I really want to open this up to the, to the participants here. What role do, does, a diagnost, does a diagnosis play in treatment and recovery? Well, I can. If, if I might answer that, for at least from my point of view, I, I spent 10 years at residential in Marquette. And what we were looking for when we started to look at the whole person as an individual, it is the substance use is normally a symptom of something greater. And while we're all overcoming whatever that greater thing is, knowing what those core issues are helps to determine how you set your treatment protocols and what, what you're working on. It's gonna be a lot different if there's an alcoholic who was raped by their father versus an alcoholic who has PTSD from the military. And these core issues, if, that's, if that's, a, that's a large part of what needs to be addressed in order to help overcome the reason why they're using to begin with. So Bob, what you're saying here is that this helps tease out kind of like uh, where we're going with treatment. What, are, what is it that we're doing? Someone in the chat had said it might show someone that they're not alone and that others experience similar situations as well. I know for me, the biggest thing when I think of why someone might seek a diagnosis is to seek treatment. You know, a lot of, a lot of treatments you can't access unless you have a diagnosed issue. Yeah, and Cheryl just said that, you know, it can qualify the individual for services. Um, one person said, at my agency, a diagnosis required for treatment and determining their level of care. Being able to label the problem or illness is a good way to make the situations more tangible and therefore more treatable. It also works in line more with the disease model than the moral character argument. Meredith pointed out a great one, billing insurance. You can't bill insurance if they don't have a diagnosis code. Um, and then Kim had diagnosed relief some of the shame. And those are all really great reasons why someone should actively seek a diagnosis. So, so diagnosing is kind of a tricky thing. And I do a lot of diagnosing and have over the course of my career because a diagnosis does a couple of things. The, the purpose of the diagnosis is really to help the entire care team understand what it is that's being treated. We have a criteria, which helps to establish medical necessity, and, and it helps that we can share this broad diagnosis with anyone who's involved in the person's treatment, and everyone is, should be on the same page. Now, the byproduct of this is the individual often experience a level of um, feeling stigmatized, right? What does it mean if I have an alcohol use disorder? What does it mean if I have an opioid use disorder? Well, I must be dirty, right? Because um, that's what I hear in the news. Um, and, and so I think this idea of diagnosing is important. It, and as brought up here, uh, it's how we get paid. Um, 
It helps care teams understand what services we are able to offer. Um, it drives a lot of the services that we do offer. And as we are talking to people about their diagnosis and, and what diagnoses that they may be working on, I think this is our opportunity to share with people, you are not alcohol use disorder, you are Jane, right? And, and reminding people that a, di diagno a diagnosis does not define who they are as a person. What I often hear from my clients is that a diagnosis does in some way define them. And I'm always working with them to try and walk away from that as much as possible and remind them that they're, they're, that a diagnosis really is for, for me and my purposes. It does not change who they are or define them. I think going back to the stigma too is that a lot of people don't realize that medical professionals can fall victim to stigmatizing illnesses as well. You know, for someone that does have that SUD label on my chart, it's, you know, I go into the doctor or the emergency room and that's the first thing that they bring up. Or if I need pain medication for anything, it's always a fight for me to get it because I have the SUD label. So it's not just educating the people that are here in this training, it's also educating the medical professionals and destigmatizing it in that as well. You know, Kate brought up something great in the chat. Um, that is gonna that plays into our next slide that we're gonna be talking about that it's impossible for people to get into recovery supports right now. You know, getting into detox or residential treatment, or even getting into a psych doctor to address their medical or their psych issues and getting on medication. It's such a long wait right now. We've got another question here about how to help. Um, talk to someone who has been using substances that really doesn't feel like they do have an issue. We're going to talk a little bit about stages of change. Um, this is a pre-contemplative um, type situation. This is where the DSM or the diagnostic criteria can be really helpful because you can run through these different scenarios with people and kind of identify um, what numbers they check, right, as a yes, and it can help drive kind of our diagnosing and help them to identify some of those symptoms. One of the big changes that happened from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5 is we went away from this idea of sub substance abuse and substance dependence. That's, that's how I was trained when I came up, right, is uh, those two different dis uh, distinctions. And we went into more of a continuum. So there's a substance use disorder, mild, moderate, or severe, really depends on how many of these people check and that helps to drive kind of the level of care that they might need. Any other questions on diagnosing or the diagnostic criteria? All right. So uh, Susanna, I think you had brought up a question here and this is the, the slide that I'm hoping to get to it. Um, so as we're looking at different treatment approaches for people who struggle with substance use disorders. Um, we were talking about the slide and we went kind of back and forth on how we wanted to present this and how we wanted to talk about it. Um, there are tons and tons of barriers to, barriers to treatment right now. Um, we know that services are limited. Um, there are long wait times. One of the most important things that we can do for people who are currently struggling with a substance use disorder is be ready to act when they are ready to act, right? Um, and the, our current system being backlogged makes that pretty difficult to, to do. So um, we were kind of organizing these in, in um, our idea of what's the most important thing or, or what's the biggest barrier to treatment? Readiness to change is probably number one. You have someone who comes in and they just don't really actually feel like they have a problem, but everyone else in their life feels like they do. It's gonna be really, really hard to engage with them um, towards some sort of change, some sort of um, process towards recovery. 
cost and insurance is a huge barrier. Uh, recovery programs are expensive. Um, you know, if you don't have insurance, uh, they can be very hard to, to access. Um, generally, what I have found over the course of my life in, in, in this field is that those with, with many, many, many means are able to get whatever kind of treatment they want because they've got the, the cash to uh, throw at it. And those that um, have less means, we have a, a poor system in place to get them into services quickly, right? And so there's these giant disparities between our socioeconomic classes and how people are accessing care. Um, diagnosis, we just talked about that, and treatment availability, we've talked about that, that, that in some respects it can be weeks, sometimes months to get into care when, we, when people are actually ready, time comes for them to come in and, and they have switched their tune. Mm -hmm. So when we look at readiness to change, we're talking about stages of change. Um, we're gonna get into this in the next slide. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about um, helping our clients get connected with different treatment options, it's really digging in with folks about where they're at and what options are available to them. So Nance, I'll let you uh, cover the treatment options that we've got here on the slides. Okay. Um, so just in the chat, a couple people brought up uh, some other barriers, barriers that they could think of. Um, Bob, I wanna get to your comment on the next slide because I think that will really play into it and be very important. Um, Brittany said reliable transportation, absolutely. Um, especially for um, MATP services like Suboxone or Methadone. A lot of these people have to come in every day to dose or every week to dose. Um, so I think it's important to get them set up with bus passes if your um, agency offers them. Um, set them up with their insurance company. I know a lot of Medicaid, play, uh, Medicaid providers will provide rides for um, doctor's appointments. But yeah, transportation is a battle that we face every day. So some of the treatment options, and this is just a very brief, quick overview, definitely not all encompassing. Um, you know, there's the inpatient options when someone might go to detox, um, to detox from the substance they're on before going into inpatient, or, you know, maybe they just want to detox. Um, they're short and long-term residential, so someone might go for 30, 60, 90 days um, to get stabilized, and then they're back out into um, general population. There might be um, long-term residential, like recovery housing, where they can stay there as long as they want. Um, we have step-down programs. I know that Cherry Health has the Community Alternative Program. Um, which is kind of like a halfway house where people will be released from prison into the halfway house while they finish out their sentence. Um, for outpatient, we have medication um, for opiates. <laughs> so, uh, some of those are methadone, suboxone, Vivitrol. Um, I know Bob is going to talk a little bit more about the differences of those. Um, endless types of counseling that they can um, get into. They have peer supports and recovery coaching, which is a great resource if your agency offers it. Um, and then basically every town has self-help groups, you know, NA, AA, a Smart Recovery. Um, there is a hundred different types of those um, self-help groups. And I really urge you to look it up in your area what you have make a list you know there is a ton of online resources right now since COVID happened with online meetings with phone meetings um basically any time of day someone can find a meeting either in person or online so i think it's a really good idea for people who work with people in recovery to have that list easily accessible to be able to give to clients i think an important um, factor in all of this is is that people often come to recovery in different ways and they do not follow a linear path, right? So we've got this broken down. You've got your inpatient, you've got your outpatient, you do your peer stuff, then you go to self-help groups, right? Like 
lots of times people come to recovery by one or all of these, right? They mm -hmm. might not start detox. They might actually start at a self-help group and then realize that they need to go to t detox and then not want to go to inpatient, but they're willing to do outpatient. And then outpatient doesn't work so great. And then they end up inpatient and then they come back to outpatient and then they go to Medicaid, right? So the, the point here is that there's lots of different ways to access these services. Um, our jobs are to help identify the least restrictive setting, helping people get connected to the right services so that they're getting their, their, their needs met and making sure that we're meeting them at the right spot. And so uh, this is gonna kind of lead into our next slide um, where we talk a little bit about that. Um, but I, I don't wanna lose track of Zoom Susanna's question here. Um, and I think between these two slides, we're gonna get into that. Susanna, can you remind me that question? I've, it's fallen out of my brain. Um, I know I told you we get here, we're here. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to hear some suggestions to provide for clients or friends or family members of clients to uh, still be able to support them, the, the ones struggling with addiction while still feeling like they can have boundaries. I know, especially for families, whether it's a, a husband and wife or, or couple, married couple of any sort or siblings, they they want to help their 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 loved one, but they feel like they need to keep some sort of a distance. Um, so, if you had any suggestions on being able to support your loved one while still maintaining healthy boundaries, Nancy, you want think, to tackle that? Yeah. Thanks. So, I think that the main thing that they need to remember and should probably, you know, be said a million times to them is you cannot help them until they are ready. Um, you know, you can tell someone that they have a substance use problem until they're, until you're blue in the face, but until they're ready to recognize that, nothing is going to change. In fact, you know, the further you push people, the further you might, the further they might get pushed away from recovery. Um, absolutely, like you said, set boundaries that is so important and enforce those boundaries. As far as things to say to people that are struggling with substance use who aren't ready to admit it, I think that expressing your concern about them is a really good place to start. You know, being very specific. I'm concerned because you got fired. I'm concerned because you lost your housing. I'm concerned about your mental health, your physical health. If you can point out those very specific things for them, it might be easier for them to realize that substances are affecting their life in ways that they might not have realized. And I think it's really important for the family members and friends to educate themselves about, about what addiction looks like. You know, maybe go to an Al-Anon meeting, which is for friends and family of people who are in active addiction. Maybe it's reading up about how the substances affect a person's brain. Um, Al-Anon meetings are phenomenal because it connects you with people that are going through similar situations with you. And a lot of times you can hear a lot of, a lot of things that they have done that have helped them and you can implement, and then the person can implement them in their lives. So we've also, you've heard me say this idea of like stage matched objectives. And when I say stage matched objectives, what I'm talking about is our stages of change. This is gonna lead right into what Nance was talking about here. So our stages of change, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, relapse. Oftentimes these are displayed kind of as a circle where someone's kind of moving through those stages of change. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, people jump around in those stages of change. One day they might be in, in action, ready to go, doing all the right things. And then the next day they come in and they're in pre-contemplation. Pre-contemplation, this idea that I don't have a problem, everyone else needs to leave me alone and I'm just fine. Contemplation being like, maybe I have a problem, maybe I don't. Contemplating it. Preparation, yes, I have an issue. Yes, I need to make changes. I'm planning with my therapist all the really good ways that I can improve my life. Action, following through with those changes, going to the doctor, 
eating well, sleeping well, taking our medication, relapse, that's that return, that lapse, right? Maybe there's a, a hiccup there. Um, and then maintenance is where we've, we've kind of achieved a level of recovery and here we are with our better, our, our life worth living. Um, people jump around in those all the time. One of the things that as a therapist I am highly in tune with is where is someone at in, in their stages of change? Because if I come at someone in an action stage of change and they are very pre-contemplative, we might as well be speaking two different languages and I'm turning them off the whole time as, I, as, I'm, helping, as I'm helping to push them along through this process. So oftentimes people in pre-contemplation goes right into the question that was asked. They need to have a discussion about what's going on. Didactics, talking about it. These are the things that I'm noticing. Maybe you pull out that DSM criteria. You're helping to educate the client or the, you know, the member, or the, the person about how their substance use is impacting maybe you now, right? Look, all of us are going to struggle with, uh, are going to experience substance use either ourselves or with our family members or our friends. We are going to be dealing with, with people at some point in our lives who struggle with substance use. Um, at some level, we should be ready to use a good, clear communication vocabulary in working with those people, right? Because that's gonna help them help push them along, not us beating them up and saying, you have a problem and you must get help. I wanna go back to um, Bob's comment too that he said, an important thing to remember is that when we feel and think of that what we feel and think a person is going through is not as important as what they feel and think about themselves. Maybe give examples of what a substance abuser may be facing and then ask if these issues that your client shares. And I think that's a good way to, you know, just saying someone in substance abuse may be facing these challenges. Are these challenges that you see you're facing? that you're facing as well. And I think that goes back to, you know, asking those very direct or saying those very direct statements of, I'm worried about you because you lost your job. I'm worried about you because you lost your housing. These are symptoms someone in active addiction might be facing. I and there see. Has, oh, sorry. sorry there has been in the chat, a great list of resources for different areas too. So if you want to take a look at that as well. And then um, Nicolette pointed out to be aware of the pink cloud syndrome as well. Does, does everyone know what the pink cloud syndrome is or no? No, okay. So the pink cloud syndrome is basically early in recovery when things are going great, you think that you're cured, nothing's wrong anymore, and you get lazy in your recovery, basically. And to go along with that, I'll throw my clinical two cents here. So we have this thing that we talk about in the substance use treatment world called post-acute withdrawal symptoms. Um, oftentimes we don't talk about them. Everyone is very in tune with what acute withdrawal looks like, right? Especially for alcohol and opioids and, and benzos. But this idea of post-acute withdrawal symptoms, these onset generally six to nine months after someone discontinues, three to nine months after someone discontinues uh, their use of substances. And it's all of the like really icky feelings that we have that just pop up out of nowhere. So it's like irritability, anxiety, sleeplessness, restlessness. Um, you just kind of feel bad. And if we don't talk about it with people who are early on in the recovery, all of a sudden it hits and they say, what is going on? Everything was great and now it's fall all falling apart. Screw it, I'm out of here, right? And they go back to their use. And so this is a really important concept that um, I teach to my staff and I talk with my clients about, chances are it's gonna happen. That post-acute withdrawal symptoms, those can go on. I mean, 
the, the literature is pretty vague on this. They talk about 18 months, 36 months, but the reality is, is depending on how much damage we've done to our brain, it could be lifelong. Um, and so our, our folks need to be aware of that uh, as they're working towards a recovery program. Mm -hmm. Yes. And someone uh, put a great link to an article about Pink Cloud in the chat. Um, I've actually read the article, it's really great. So I would suggest everyone look at that as well. Um, someone asked a question, uh, Sophia, I do therapy groups for prison. My group at times are as large as 15 inmates. One issue that I encounter is that inmates are in different stages of change, which at times make the, makes the dynamic of default. Do you have any ideas on how to overcome this? So I used to run um, a group that was um, kind of based out of OSAS, Office of Substance Abuse Services. This was way back when. Um, and I think that when, when we're talking about in a group setting or meeting with a bunch of different people with uh, different stages of change, we are less likely to have problems if we are focusing on kind of those beginning stages of change or wherever the, the first stage of change is for your group members, right? So if everyone in the group is action, you probably want to be implementing a group that is action focused. But if you have someone in that group who's pre-contemplative and you're focusing on action, they're going to be the person in the group that makes your life difficult right? They're going to be the one who's challenging everyone. They're going to be the one who's, who's trying to tell you why you're wrong because it's really important to them. That's okay, right? They, they should be in pre-contemplation. That's where they're at. We just need to switch gears. So we need to be sure that our services that we are providing are focused on where our clientele stage of change is at. Um, your action folks, they're going to get it. They're not going to worry about it, right? They're going to, they're going to get their needs met. Your pre-contemplation folks, they're going to get their needs met. And so you just kind of focus on providing the right interventions based on stages of change. Um, for me anyways, especially with groups, it's always trying to do my best, giving myself lots of grace. And this is the most important thing, especially with addictions. Um, we want to be directive with people. We want to offer validation and we also want to hold people accountable. Those are things that we should be able to do when we are working with people, especially with people who might struggle with a substance use disorder. Hopefully that was helpful. All right, I think we're quickly running out of time. Let's, uh, Nance, let's go to our terms to avoid and why and okay. get near. So I think this is probably my favorite slide of the presentation because I it really ties in great with the stigma that we had talked about and the plethora of ways that can affect someone seeking treatment. So I think if we can we rework our language as general public, general public treatment providers, we can really try to reduce that stigma. Um, we really want to use person first language, um, you know, like Bob said, the person isn't defined by their illness. You know, we're not saying that diabetes person or that, that person who had a heart attack, you know, we're talking about them as a person who has diabetes or a person who had a heart attack. And I think that it's really important that this transfers over to substance use as well, you know, we don't need to be using addict or junkie or substance or drug abuser, or drunk or alcoholic. You know, it really should be a person with the substance use disorder or a person who has alcohol use or opiate or whatever disorder. Um, and this just really helps focus on the person and not their diagnosis, you know. Um, so when we talk about actively using, you know, habit is a term that's thrown around out there a lot. Uh, we should really use terms like substance use disorder or drug addiction. Um, and this, this ties in with the medical model versus the moral dilemma. Um, you know, if you say someone has a habit, that implies that they can just stop when they want to stop. You know, if that was the case, 
we won't be having this training. <laughs> um, when we talk about abuse, I think that that also falls into the moral deficit area. You know, if someone is abusing drugs, again, why don't they just stop? Um, so we want to use terms like using or misuse or and that plays in with the use versus misuse that we talked about a little bit earlier. You know, someone might be misusing their prescription drugs. Um, so does anyone have questions about um, terms to avoid and why we might avoid them? This slide right here, the second slide, this clean and dirty, you, you guys already heard my soapbox about that, right? But this is probably one of the most impactful two statements that I hear all the time. Yes. Yeah, you know, even people who are still in recovery might refer to it as clean and dirty because that's all they've known. And I think that if we can shift their thinking about it as well, that is really going to help them in recovery. You know, when someone says, oh, I had a clean drop, you know, try to be like, you had a favorable drop. I mean, you know, I'm really proud of you. Or or if someone says, oh, my drop is going to be dirty, if we can shift their language to, well, it's unfavorable, how can we help you in your recovery? You know, we tell, we do urine drug screens for our program, and we always tell people it's not punitive, it helps us keep an eye on your recovery. Um, you know, if we see that you have an unfavorable drop, it shows us that you are struggling in your recovery, and how can we support you? Um, and another term that is pretty horrible is when we talk about um, babies who are born to mothers who use substances. You know, God, what was it? crack baby was really popular in the 80s. Um, I think it's really important to realize that babies are not born addicted to drugs. They are born withdrawing from substances. Um, so it's important to differentiate those and as Bob said, when you hear people using this problematic language, point it out and give them terms that they can be using that are better for everyone involved in the situation. I think we had a hand up. Natalie, did you have a question? I did, and then y'all kind of answered it, so I put it back down, was kind of going into that when, when folks are using language that isn't positive towards themselves and, and rephrasing that, or even when they're speaking on folks around them in, you know, similar situations, but maybe folks who are using more heavily, things like that, um, just having that language to it's just, I just was like, can I use this language with them to rephrase things? Yes, I can. So that yeah. was super helpful. And I was just commenting to be like, I put my hand down because you answered it. So, but thank you both so much. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So I, I supervised a number of recovery coaches over the years. And this language is very, very prevalent, right? Like so much so that I've had to have this conversation even with my recovery coaches where I'm like, man, I, I noticed that you're using the term clean a lot, right? Like help me understand. And, um, and, you know, it, it's kind of like when we think about our self-help groups, our AA, our NA, our smart recovery, these are terms that are so ingrained as being acceptable that they just flow out, right? Like yes. I, talk, I talked about mm -hmm. um, NPR and I talked about uh, MLive and like, you know, I, I really do think it's on all of us who recognize this as being an issue to call it out. Um, that we should be helping to coach and, and help people make that shift on, on what's an appropriate way of talking about this. I also mentioned here that every single one of us is going to deal with some sort of substance use disorder at some point, whether or not that's ourselves, loved ones, friend, friends or family, it's going to happen, right? I bet, you know, I'm not going to take this poll, but, you know, if we took a poll of how many of us who have lost a loved one or a friend to an opioid overdose, I think most of us would would fall out of our seats, right? I mean, like it is so prevalent that we all need to be mindful of the words that we are using. It chases people away from recovery. It chases them away from help. And so if you walk out of here with anything today, I hope it's this. Definitely. Yes. No, thank you. That is super helpful. Um, 
Kate said in the chat, the other thing I noticed is parole agents do not care if THC is found in a drug test. The shelter I work at is low barrier, so we do not require clients to be in recovery. But also I notice if clients do not address their substance use before housing, they end up back at the shelter or back in active use. Absolutely. You know, that goes back to we can't expect people to focus on their recovery if they aren't having their basic needs met. Um, so it's, you know, it's really important that we, when they are in these low barrier um, shelters, that they're accessing all, all the services that are available to them, getting counseling, working on their substance use before they transition into housing. And then hopefully those supports continue after they transition into housing or they're set up with um, help that they can access. One of the, the cannabis legalization kind of uh, shifted things for the type of work that I did, right? And I do do. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I picked up out of Seeking Safety, um, which is a, a treatment model to address substance use and trauma, is that we don't need to argue with people about things, right? So alcohol is legal, cannabis is legal in, in the state of Michigan, like all good. I don't need to argue with you about that. Because what I, my, my question is, is smoking pot the safest thing that you could do, right? And and their their answer might be yes. Smoking pot or drinking alcohol mm -hmm. is the safest way I can cope with whatever it is going on with me. That's my cue that someone needs to be connected with better services, get in with a counselor, identify new ways of coping and, and towards recovery and, and helping them shift that narrative that substances are not your safest way of resolving issues. Short term, mm -hmm they are a band-aid. Long-term, they create more problems. This is where our didactics come in when we're working with people um, in early recovery to help them talk through that process. So Kate asked, anything I can do, I'm not a recovery coach and I encourage folks, but as we said, we can't force them. Um, I think the biggest thing I did to start my career off in this field is I, created a resource binder. Um, I found every available resource that our community offers and kind of put that together. So when someone needs those resources, they're easily accessible and you can give them out. You know, no resource is unneeded. You're going to eventually need it. So I think that going out to your community, making calls, trying to find a contact person for every organization you can think of is great because then you can always call them straight away. But resources are gonna be the biggest thing that you can do to make your job easier, is have them in place so when someone needs them, you can give them because you're right, Kate, we can't force them. All we can do is offer them the resources and give them the help when they do come and say they're ready. Can I um, add a comment on that? Do you mind? Yeah, go for it. So um, I work with folks who, um, you know, are in the process of obtaining housing. Um, and most often, if they've mentioned recovery as a goal of theirs, I just ask them when we check in, like, hey, is sobriety still a goal that you're working on? Do you need any more supports or resources for that? And like, just let them kind of tell me, because if they're at a point where they um, are on a good path, they might not need resources, that's great, but then a month later, they might, you know, be in that lapsing area and might need some additional supports. And I just ask like, hey, is that still a goal you're working on? Because I'm also not a recovery coach, but, mm -hmm. you know, I know that their, their journey does play a huge part in them maintaining their housing long term, that it's just that like, check in are you still you know checking in with your mental health like do you need more supports and just letting them kind of take the lead on that because ultimately they know what they're ready for and what they need they might not know what resource it is you know I might have that information but like mm -hmm. most times I find that folks are like if they want it they will ask me for it. Mm -hmm. Natalie what you're doing is you're you're providing a, a safe supportive environment where that person can come to you and feel safe in sharing what's going on, right? And, and that is the number one thing that we can do for, for people struggling. Let's offer a safe, supportive environment. 
free of stigma, uh, you know, free of any of those negative perceptions. Let's just offer a space where people can be themselves and feel comfortable asking for help. And person first language is a very important part of that because it lets that person know that you are a safe person. Um, you know, if you're calling people with substance use issues, substance use disorders, junkies or crackheads, that person is not going to want to go to you for help because they're going to think that you have that negative perception of people who use substances. So it only helps. Melanie asked, I was taught to use sober over clean, is this okay? Um, ish, um, I see, <laughs> I think Bob and I are on the same page. I think sober has a lot of different meanings and it really depends on where that person is. You know, if that person's drug of choice was opiates and they're smoking pot because that helps them not smoke or not use opiates, is that person sober or are they working for recovery? I think that we want to find out what everyone's definition of sober is and help them get there. A term we've started using in Washtenaw County is um, person in long-term recovery mm -hmm. from yep. substance abuse or substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be sub someone from in short-term recovery from, but just again, dropping the the negativity associated with mm -hmm. those adjectives. Mm -hmm. That's great language to use, Kim. Uh, Karen says, I check on people I know every two weeks that are in active addiction, but not ready yet, just so they know they can count on me to vent or a ride to a meeting or rehab. They need that support that they aren't alone in fighting it. And I think that's that's a really great thing to continue doing, you know, just letting them know, hey, I'm here for you. I'm checking on you. You're not alone. So. Well, thank you to all of our speakers today. This is Amy. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I've sat in on a lot of training, and I have to say this was the most conversational one that I've observed so I really want to thank the facilitators for just um, navigating all these questions. It really was incredible.